our society view success? Money. Money. Okay. Uh, anything else? How does our society view success? Yes. Status. Material. If, if I didn't wear this nice new suit today and I just came in my clothes that I usually wear to work because I work out of my home, um, you probably wouldn't think I was very successful. So how about applause for the suit? <laughs> trust in order to gain respectability in our society. That's what our society views as success. You've got to be, you know, it's the, the uh, level that you have to be at to be considered successful. I'll tell you a little, just a little anecdote. Um, at the Illinois Institute of Art where I teach design, um, there's this old man who is the maintenance guy. And I thought he was kind of interesting, so I decided I was going to kick up a conversation with him because I had a feeling there was more there than met the eye. And uh, it turned out that he escaped Warsaw, Poland yeah. during World War II. He saw his, um, yay for Poland. Um, well, my parents are World War II. Oh, so they, um, they, are, they immigrated when, uh, when their city was destroyed. I mean, he lived through the, the most horrific things. Right. So we talked about that, and then another day I met him in the little faculty workroom, and, and um, he sat down, he said, you know, what, this country, I don't understand. He said, everyone thinks of me as a loser here because I'm a maintenance man. And then he went on to tell me that in Poland, he had been a geneticist. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, you know, so he had, you know, he has these feelings about our country that, you know, we, we've got these um, really bizarre ideas of what success is. And um, so let's kind of maybe rethink what is success and what is living abundantly and what is, um, uh, you know, our own idea of what is going to matter to us when we draw our last breath. Isn't that a cheerful thought? Sorry to put that into your heads, but start thinking about it now. You know, everybody has your, the young people thinking about, oh, start thinking about your retirement. You know, think about living. Mm -hmm. Think about living. And if thinking about what's going to be important to you on, uh, you know, on your deathbed helps, then think about that. Because it's going to happen one way or the other. Okay, on to the next cheery subject. How are creative professionals viewed in our society? Loony. Uh, Loony? Eccentric. Eccentric? Um, how are they viewed? Stuck up. What's that, Rich? How are they viewed? Or, it are depends. You? I mean, most people don't consider you a creative professional unless you have like huge, huge, you know, <coughs> widely recognized commercial success. And that's the American culture seeping in. I was sitting in on um, Olga Stefan's presentation um, for art, for visual artists. And um, one of the things she said, she, she asked the audience, how do you define professional artists? And of course, the first thing that um, someone said was, you make your living that way. And um, she had a different definition. It is a person with a very focused goal to be able to make a living from their work of art, and then you just stay focused on that. You're still an artist. So we also have to shift that way of thinking, that we're not an artist until there was a gentleman in the room and he said, well, I didn't think of myself as an artist until I made it into my first jury show. And, you know, what came up in my mind was the last scene of The Wizard of Oz, where the guy's handing out the diploma and all of a sudden the scarecrow has brains. You know, he had them before. So it's this idea of knowing who you are and what you're capable of doing. You don't need external uh, awards and, I mean, it's great to get them, okay? I mean, the highlight of my career was when I was named Woman of the Year for Women in Design Chicago. I love that award, but I love that award because it was a really authentic award. I, I, I won that award based on the fact that I was an inspiration uh, not just for my work, I was an inspiration to women because of the way I balanced family and work. That felt really good to me, okay? So now I have the trust 
that I am the real thing now that I have told you my big award. That means a lot to people, but it really doesn't mean all that much. Okay, so the current paradigm for success in our culture is based on our ability to multitask. It's based on our ability to be consumers, okay? It's based on our ability to be a jack of all trades. When I go online and I try to check out what are people hiring for graphic design positions looking for these days, I am absolutely astounded by how many things people are expected to be able to do just to get this job. I'm completely amazed. And I don't know how they can be, and, and two to three years experience. So in other words, we want you to be a master of all these things, but we only want you to have two or three years of experience because we're gonna drain every ounce of blood, ounce of creative blood out of you for the least amount of dollars. That's what it's all about. And there's something wrong with that. There's, there's something wrong with uh, that setup. Not that we can change it, but to be aware of it. Um, our, our availability 24-7 Okay, I'm from the age of no cell phones. I'm from the age of, well, the, the computer was in a back room off the design lab and some, you know, geeky guys were back there making circles with it. It's like, what is that, <laughs> you know? I don't need to know that. Um, so I don't want to be available 24-7. I don't want clients calling me at night. I've never allowed that. I've always had a real delineation. Now that, that means that there are going to be some clients that won't work with you because of that. But I say, good. You know, I, I, are we slaves? You know, I, and also the idea that we should keep making changes ad infinitum on projects until our hourly rate is uh, probably less than the people who make Nike shoes in Indonesia. Okay? So there are some we'll get to some of the tips I have for um, protecting yourself. Really, this talk is also about protecting your creativity and you know, being your own advocate, really. All right, so our ability to, uh, one of the things that our success supposedly rests on is our ability to suppress our right brain selves to fit into a left brain world. And my point is, is that, yeah, you can do that. I did it. I did it for a very long time. And I did it very successfully. And I can really look the look, OK? However, just be conscious of the fact that living like that will do damage to creative people. It will do damage. So we're sort of challenged with how do we shift the paradigm for ourselves? How can we live in this linear world at the same time that um, you know we're highly right brain? I'm left-handed on top of it all, mm -hmm. so you know uh, I have problems with keyboards. You know I'm, I, I kind of am awkward with them sometimes. Um, uh, so you know this is a real challenge for us. It's not a cookie cutter that we can fit into. Uh, comfortably for a long time over time, okay? So just be, be aware of that. And, and I'm wondering, how did things get this way? I mean, there's a major burnout factor for us creatives, and, and that's what I want you to, to be aware of. <coughs> that, oh yeah, I want, you know, you're young, you're gonna get out there, you're gonna make money. Yes, you are, you're gonna do all those things. And you also need to be aware in your fight for success, in your struggle to get on top, that you may really, in the long run, be doing harm to yourself, creatively, physically, emotionally. So how did our society get this way? Here is an image that's coming up of Plato. We all know Plato. We like Plato. He's great. He's a wonderful man. He has many brilliant things. He's a genius, in fact. I'm not saying that um, facetiously. However, did you know that Plato held a very negative view of artists? He proposed banishing artists from his ideal state. He believed art had no value aside from technique and as imitation of nature. He felt that only philosophers could really translate nature. Only philosophers, of course, he was one. 
He loved Homer, but he recommended banishing his works. And uh, only the philosopher, as I mentioned, can interpret the essential truth. All right, which society is our entire Western civilization based on? Greek. Greek, right. Greek and also Roman was built, you know, some of the ideas from Rome. But basically our ideas about democracy, our ideas about everyday life come from this classical period of ancient Greece, about 450 BC, okay? They also didn't think women were equal. Now, what does that have to do, you know, I'm not, this isn't a feminist talk. I want you to start thinking about being feminine as being related to being creative. So in our society, the, the feminine is pushed down. And if you think of that not in terms of gender, but in terms of being a creative person, this is where it comes from. This is my theory, by the way. So you can agree or disagree with me or say, oh, she's nuts. It doesn't matter. But this is, this is what uh, a connection that I made uh, with this information about Plato. I think things need to change, and we're going to do it. We're going to get together, and we're going to make things change. So um, suppressing art is the same thing as suppressing the essential female. I was on a panel discussion right beforehand uh, for arts advocacy. And some of the things that I learned, I was sitting on the panel next to the gentleman who is the executive director of the um, Illinois Arts Ad Advocacy um, Council. And I learned a lot from him. And you know, I was never a <coughs> political person, but um, I have become more politically interested over the last couple of years because I want to make sure that my senators are getting um, uh, my feedback on what I think is important because they're cutting arts funding like mad. And my belief is that we're really going, we're really a country losing its very soul. And uh, these things are not superfluous. I think that's the problem for a lot of us artists too. Uh, society says, you know, we're icing on the cake, we're superfluous. And we are much more than that. We are much more than that. Uh, we are every bit of as, as important as doctors or lawyers. It's just that you know our culture just doesn't see this uh, in that way. Now they they thought art was important in ancient Greece, so there's a little bit for that. But they fought about building the Parthenon. There are records. Most of the people didn't want to spend money on it. So thank God somebody was thinking. Thank God someone was visionary back there in ancient Greece, right? And we wouldn't have the Parthenon. So we had the Parthenon, they did bankrupt the system right in there. I'm glad they did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad they did. It was worth it for us. It was, yeah. <laughs> um, and then two or three thousand years of architecture is based on the Parthenon. Um, I didn't know that it got bankrupted. I thought that they were collecting, you know, they were taking in defense money from all different cities. So I didn't know that particular fact about that. But anyway.